When it comes to the ongoing anthology series American Horror Story, the amount of twists and turns and time traveling can get a little confusing, so we're here to help you make sense of the entire American Horror Story timeline. In the first season, Murder House, we learn that famous Hollywood surgeon Dr. Charles Montgomery built a classic Los Angeles Victorian mansion for his wife Nora while they were flush with celebrity money. But their fortune quickly turned sour as Charles's mental illness and Frankenstein complex forced him to give basement abortions to make ends meet. The husband of one client killed Charles and Nora's son in retaliation, cutting him up into pieces. Charles stitched the boy back together, along with other people's parts, creating the monstrous Infantata. Was it this grotesque series of acts that turned the Montgomery house evil, or was the evil there all along? This question has yet to be answered, but when Ben, Vivian, and Violet Harmon move into the haunted mansion in 2011, it's been home to dozens of suspicious deaths. It's not long before the Harmons realize the ghosts of those people are very much active within the house's walls, including their housekeeper Moira, who appears to Ben as a seductive young woman, and to Vivian as a sad but helpful older woman. And as if that wasn't enough for the poor Harmons, Constance, Tate, and Addie Langdon are nosy next-door neighbors who constantly appear in their house without invitation, and they only hint at the house's sordid past without mentioning their own role in it. Plus, Tate is having therapy sessions with Ben, and he and Violet quietly begin falling in love until a new series of tragedies strike. Ben has been unfaithful to Vivian in the past, so when he shows up in a kinky black rubber suit, Vivian thinks he's trying to rekindle the previous passion of their marriage. Unfortunately, it isn't Ben in the suit. The so-called rubber man is actually Tate Langdon. And worse, the Harmons find out that Tate is another of the ghosts haunting the house, having killed himself on the property after committing a mass shooting at school. Creepier still, after getting it on with a ghost, Vivian is suddenly pregnant with twins, one of whom is decidedly not human. I'm sure you're aware that these babies, well, rather one of these babies, has been developing at a rapid rate. The human child is stillborn, and the other is revealed to be the Antichrist, born from spirit and flesh as prophesied by the psychic Billy Dean Howard. The hits for the Harmons don't stop there. Tate convinces Violet to overdose on sleeping pills so they can be together forever. She and her parents don't realize she's dead until she tries to escape Murder House and can't leave. We then learn that Tate had hidden her dead body underneath the house. Sadly, Vivian dies during childbirth, a birth overseen by the ghost of Charles Montgomery, and she becomes a new addition to the house. She tells Ben to take the surviving child and escape, but the ghost of Ben's lover, Hayden, kills him before he can. Constance Langdon takes the baby, her grandson, instead. Of course, there are no happy endings here, as the first season of American Horror Story ends three years later, with Constance finding that her infant grandson has brutally killed his nanny and is playing with her blood. Set mostly in 1964, second season Asylum starts off with Kit Walker, a man who's kidnapped by aliens. After his wife and friend disappear, Kit is imprisoned in Briarcliff Manor, an asylum for the criminally insane where the staff are more disturbed than their patients. Headed by Sister Jude, Briarcliff is a religious institution that handles its vulnerable patients with more torture than care. Many of the patients aren't even the criminals they've been painted to be, like Pepper, a gentle nonverbal microcephalic woman falsely accused of killing a baby, as well as promiscuous Shelley, whose husband locked her up for cheating. On the medical staff are Dr. Oliver Thredson in charge of counseling and the sadistic Dr. Arden, a Nazi doctor who's performing horrific experiments on Briarcliff residents. Meanwhile, Lana Winters is a young gay journalist who's been searching for her big break. Since lesbianism was considered a mental illness at the time, Lana gets herself committed to Briarcliff to produce an expose about its gruesome ongoing events. She discovers that Dr. Threadson is Bloody Face, a serial killer who's been sexually assaulting, skinning, and decapitating women after he drugs and kidnaps her. However, she's his only surviving victim. Why? Because she's pregnant with his baby. Lana's story shocks America after she exposes Briarcliff and Threadson, but years later, we find out that a bloody-faced copycat who's been killing people at an abandoned Briarcliff is Lana and Threadson's son. In the third season Coven, New Orleans is home to Miss Robichaux's Academy for Exceptional Young Ladies, a boarding school for witches run by the supreme witch Fiona Good. Fiona has superpowers that she wields for her own narcissistic ends, rather than the good of her community. Unfortunately for Fiona, signs emerge that a new Supreme is on the rise as Fiona's health and looks begin failing. There can only be one Supreme at a time, and the old Supreme must die for the new one to take the mantle. 
The most promising Supreme candidates at Roba shows include Timid Zoe, Confident Queenie, Self-Involved Madison Montgomery, and Sweet Nan. Until Misty Day, an almost killed Swamp Witch with a penchant for Stevie Nicks, takes sanctuary in the Academy. In the meantime, a group of witch hunters led by Hank Fox, husband of Robichaux headmistress Cordelia Good, is killing the new crop of witches on their way to enroll at Robichaux's. Old battle lines open anew when Fiona approaches her nemesis, voodoo queen Marie Laveau, to find out the secret of immortality so she can remain supreme forever. When Marie refuses, Fiona releases the serial killer and torturer of slaves, Delphine LaLaurie, that Marie had under her spell, wreaking new havoc. As Fiona's powers wane, the witches perform a series of tests called the Seven Wonders to see who will ascend the Supreme Throne. Ultimately, Cordelia passes all seven tests, resurrecting Zoe who died during hers. Misty Day ends up trapped in purgatory, and Madison's narcissism gets her sent to hell. American Horror Story's fourth season, Freak Show, keeps us in the South, in the town of Jupiter, Florida, during 1952. Elsa Mars and her cabinet of curiosities run a waning lakeside carnival in a quiet town that loudly resents their presence. The era of television is at its pinnacle, and people would rather sit at home watching the screen than the antics of freaks like Lobster Boy Jimmy Darling, Ethel the Bearded Lady, Strongman Del Toledo, and his hermaphrodite wife, Desiree Dupree. To drum up sales, Elsa goes on a hunt for new monsters to join her troop, finding the wholesome conjoined twins Bet and Dot Tatler. However, Elsa's job gets even harder when a serial killer Twisty the Clown goes on a rampage, leading townsfolks to think the Carnies were responsible for the gruesome murders. More threats to the freaks emerge with Shady Stanley, who's buying and killing circus folks to sell their bodies to a medical marvel museum. Worse, a rich psychopath named Dandy Mott becomes fixated on Bet and Dot, an obsession that leads to him going on a killing spree that leaves most of Elsa's performers dead. Fortunately, Bet, Dot, and Jimmy escape and get married. And for the first time, the show makes direct references to another American Horror Story season, as Microcephalac Pepper from Asylum appears and reveals how her sister killed her own malformed child in Frame Pepper. Also, we learn that Elsa's legs were amputated in a snuff film by Asylum's villainous Nazi, Dr. Arden. Inspired by one of the most famous serial killers in American history, H. H. Holmes, the fifth season Hotel takes place in James March's Hotel Cortez in downtown Los Angeles. In 1922, March builds his hotel with a series of secret walls and basements so he can kill and dispose of guests without anyone noticing. March is also in love with a young actress, Elizabeth, whose affections belong to movie star Rudolph Valentino. So naturally, March disposes of Valentino, but not before Valentino turns Elizabeth into a vampire like him. After March's death, he leaves the Cortez to Elizabeth, now known as the Countess, who remains its owner until 2015, when she's forced to sell to fashion designer Will Drake. The Countess plans to marry Drake and kill him to get her hotel back, but the Cortez's ghost, as well as other angry parties like her transgender bartender Liz Taylor, throw wrench after wrench into her bloody plans. No pity party in my bar! All the while, a serial killer is brutalizing people based on violations of the Ten Commandments. Detective John Lowe suspects the killer is working from the hotel. Because he's on the rocks with his wife Alex, Lowe rents a room to investigate. However, over the course of the series, we learn that March had been searching for a protege for years, and by the end of Hotel, we discover that Detective Lowe is the Ten Commandments killer. Alex has also become a vampire, and the Countess entrusts all the vampire children in the Cortez to her care. We should also point out that Hotel has a reference to the first season of American Horror Story, as the Countess goes to the Montgomery house to get an abortion. However, the malformed vamp baby lives, and she tends to it to this day. Playing on its own narrative tricks, sixth season Roanoke explores the real-life disappearance of 16th century North American settlers through an in-show documentary entitled My Roanoke Nightmare, which centers around the testimony of homeowners Shelby and Matt Miller, who buy a rundown mansion in the North Carolina woods and experience supernatural terrors. They chalk it up to the inbred Polk family who previously owned the house. Matt's sister, Lee Harris, comes with her young daughter, Flora, to help out, and they all discover there are dark spirits not just in the house, but also in the woods, and life in their fixer-upper becomes a fight for survival. 
My Roanoke Nightmare is the show within the show that explores the Roanoke events featuring the folks who lived it from 2014 through 2016, along with reenactors to play Shelby and Matt, as well as Matt's sister, Lee Harris. The meta commentary goes even deeper when My Roanoke Nightmare producers decide to bring the real-life Shelby and company along with the actors playing them back to the mansion during the Blood Moon. The Blood Moon is the time when the ghosts of the area come alive and perform a series of violent rituals headed by the First Lady of Roanoke, Thomasin White, aka The Butcher. The original Supreme Scothak also manifests, ultimately possessing Lee Harris, who proceeds to go on her own killing spree. To save her daughter, Lee chooses to go with the Roanoke ghosts, and the historical mystery of the area only becomes more enigmatic. American Horror Story's seventh season, Cult, drops us into the suburb of Brookfield Heights, Michigan, in the wake of Donald Trump's inauguration in 2017. Allie and her wife Ivy own a local restaurant that's newly struggling due to divisive political rhetoric that's led to a rise in hate crimes against marginalized people in their town. As a result, Allie's childhood traumas are so severely provoked that her phobia of clowns emerges with a vengeance, as well as a serious paranoia that someone's out to get her. Ali is far from wrong. A charismatic but deeply bigoted and misogynistic man named Kai Anderson feels empowered by the new political regime and runs for public office on an open platform of hate. I said there is nothing more dangerous in this world than a humiliated man. He's also the leader of a cult that has been dressing up as clowns and killing people around town. But because nobody but Ali has witnessed the clowns, these murders get chalked up to a variety of other motives. Allie's past mental health issues make her easy to gaslight when her wife comes out as one of Kai's cult members. But in one of the more complex narrative seasons with numerous plot lines woven together, it turns out that Kai's sexist platform was orchestrated by Valerie Solanas and her lover, Bibi, in order to blast women out of complacency and into political rage. Solanas, famous for shooting Andy Warhol, is also revealed to be the infamous Zodiac killer who was never caught. After Kai is killed, Ali runs for Senate and wins, ending the season with the suggestion that she's become a new cult leader herself. In the eighth season, Apocalypse, we learn that Vivian Harmon and Tate Langdon's baby from Murder House is Michael Langdon, and he's the Antichrist, here to kickstart the end times. But first, the Hawthorne School for Exceptional Young Men, the warlock version of Mish Robichaux's Academy and Coven, mistakes him for the most powerful warlock ever known, one that might be the first male to ascend to supreme status. Michael passes all of the Seven Wonders, and he even manages to rescue Misty Day, Madison Montgomery, and Queenie from their purgatories. In the years after Coven, Queenie visited the Hotel Cortez and has been trapped there ever since. The actual Supreme, Cordelia Good, is doubtful about Michael's powers, but when her own begin to wane, she wonders if it's true he's next in line of succession. He is not. And by the time the witches figure it out, Michael has instigated nuclear war on a devastated planet, but he was unable to kill all the witches, and now they're the only ones who can stop him. Cloaked under an identity spell in Outpost 3, the former site of Hawthorne School, the witch Mallory is the up-and-coming Supreme, whose powers almost match that of Michael's. She's able to travel through time to 2015 and kill Michael before he properly comes into his Antichrist abilities, halting the apocalypse. Or so we think. Apocalypse closes in an unspecified present, where former Outpost 3 members Emily and Timothy meet, fall in love, and have a baby. Like baby Michael at the end of Murder House, their child also kills the nanny, suggesting that the birth of Satan might not have been halted at all. We also think it's necessary to highlight a particular episode directed by American Horror Story queen Sarah Paulson, where we are taken all the way back to the beginning to fill in a number of pending storylines. Following the witch Madison Montgomery and warlock Behold Chablis, the episode finds the Montgomery house in a sad state. Upon discovering her grandson was the Antichrist, Constance Langdon killed herself there so she could be with all the ghost children in the haunted mansion, including the Infantata monster. The Harmons have retreated to their own corners, with Vivian avoiding Ben at all cost, and Violet refusing to have anything to do with Tate Langdon, the boy she loved but who assaulted and impregnated her mom with the Antichrist. Thanks to Madison and Behold's meddling, they find out that the evil that had possessed Tate transferred to Michael Langdon, and Madison helps Violet and Tate reconcile, which is another strange and rare happy ending in American Horror Story. 
Madison also helps the housekeeper Moira, who'd Constance killed decades before after Moira had an affair with her husband, find her bones and then be buried with her beloved mother, finally letting her rest in peace. Now that the witches own the Montgomery house, there should be no new ghosts created within its walls. As is the case with many time travel narratives, an entire plot arc can sometimes get dismantled as the story moves between different realities and potentially parallel universes. When Mallory uses her power to alter time itself by going back to 2015 and killing Satan's son, it raises one big unanswered question. How could time travel affect the show's timeline as it stands? Well, based on the years in which they take place, the present-day events of Roanoke and Cult might not have happened at all anymore. Of course, the histories of the original Supreme, Thomas and the Butcher, the Polk family, and real-life Matt and Shelby buying the mansion could be retained, as well as the flashbacks to Valerie Solanus and Andy Warhol and Colt. But what stands of the rest of these seasons is unclear until we get more information in future episodes. Might the election results of Cult even shift in a world where a first apocalypse was nearly averted? Or since a new Antichrist gets born regardless, will the timelines play out similarly to how they already have? We can only hope new seasons will tell. In many ways, the ninth season, 1984, was something of a palate cleanser for fans of the show due to its standalone nature as a mostly straightforward slasher movie homage. Following a group of familiar American horror story faces in new roles at Camp Redwood, 1984 dove big into 80s nostalgia through the secrets of Camp Blood and all of its many ghosts, new and old. Eagle-eyed fans spotted many references in 1984 that called out or back to previous seasons of the show. From small details, like Margaret Booth buying Brycliff Manor from Second Season Asylum, and the fact that Mr. Jingle's cabin in Alaska is the same as Kit Walker's in Asylum to massive thematic connections like haunted places where the dead don't stay dead, starting all the way back in the show's opening season, Murder House. But arguably, the biggest connection 1984 has to the bigger arc of the narrative is its connection to Satan and his minions on Earth, a thread that, thanks to Apocalypse, Coven, and Hotel, has become one of the fundamental pillars of the entire American horror story tapestry. In 1984, we once again meet the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, as he forges new deals with his master Lucifer, as well as other dangerous killer ghosts. Because we don't exactly know how 1984 fits in with the changed world brought about by Apocalypse yet, all we can do is wait for future seasons of the anthology to hopefully reveal more about the larger picture. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.